everyone. I've started recording this meeting. Uh, it's just about time to start. It's 1102. We'll give people a, a chance to get into the meeting. Um, before I start going through our learning objectives. So let me... All right, so we have one person calling in. What I'm going to do is share my screen. Um, you're calling in, so you're not going to be able to see it. So I'll read over the objectives as we're going along. Um, and just stop and let me know as I go through if you have questions on the objectives. I'm not going to explain uh, each one. I'm just going to focus on those that uh, I saw people either struggling with in the labs or on the quizzes. Um, and otherwise, unless you stop and shout out that you have a question, um, I'll just keep going through them. I'll read down them as we go. So, uh, okay. all right. Th who is that? I, I don't have your name on here, only call in user. Uh, it's Jakaya. I'm in the car. Oh, okay. Uh, Hi, Jakaya. All right. Um, I'll yeah. still, I'll just, I'll read through the objectives. Holler if you have any questions. Um, how are you doing on the hypertonic, hypotonic terms? Um, I th I watched a couple of videos on the membrane thing, and I'm pretty sure that I understood it. Okay. Yeah, it's easy to confuse because osmosis looks at the movement of water down the concentration gradient, but it's water's yeah. concentration gradient, not the solute <laughs> concentration gradient. So they're reversed. It's like the flip of each other. So it's easy to get... Yeah tripped up as long as you remember those terms refer to how much salt or sugar or something is dissolved in the solution not the water and then water is always going to move toward the hypertonic solution but we'll go through that when we get to those um objectives so i'll share my video because i'll post this is being recorded and i'll post the recording later so if you want to see um any of what's on my screen you'll be able okay. to to go in and do that. Um, so I'm just projecting right now my uh, the, the lab objectives on my screen. So we start this first practical is going to cover um, our first nine labs. And so we had some general lab safety objectives, which of course we're not meeting in the lab. So appropriate lab behavior. <laughs> um, it's just, you know, knowing where the safety equipment is, all those things. We don't really have that. Um, and so can kind of skip right through those for our class and our practical. So lab one was the scientific method. And our objectives are you should describe and apply the steps of the scientific method. Uh, and that includes it starts, always starts with an observation which raises a question that leads to a hypothesis, which is your statement answering it. So you should also know um, the steps, the experiment, know the difference between qualitative and quantitative data. Our results are our analyzed or manipulated data. And when we say manipulated, we just mean we applied statistics to it. So we can talk about a whole data set instead of hundreds or thousands of data points. Um, and the conclusions are what we are able to draw based on analyzing our results. Uh, we should know the different variables involved in exp an experiment. And I always want to focus, we have one independent variable. And that's usually related to the question that we have, what happens if I do this? So my hypothesis would be a statement answering that. If I do this to the independent variable, then Here's what happens to the dependent variable. So that hypothesis should state the relationship we expect to see in our experiment and will drive how we design it. Our dependent variable, that's the thing we're going to record as our data to analyze. When I changed the independent variable, here's what happened to the dependent variable, how it changed. The change in the dependent variable depends on what I did to the independent variable. 
Uh, and then constants or controlled variables, this is one of the more common mistakes with this is confusing the control group with the controlled variables. So the control group is what I'm going to compare my results with so I can interpret them. So I know here's what would have happened anyway if I didn't change the independent variable intentionally, this would have happened anyway. So for example, if we want to know the effects of fertilizer on plant growth, well, the plant's going to grow anyway. What we don't know is how much. So we would have a plant that we don't apply fertilizer to and one that we do. So we can compare the results to see what effect the fertilizer had. Without the control group, we could say, wow, the, look how much the fertilizer helped the plant grew. What if it grew less than the plant without fertilizer? So that gives us a comparison point. Positive and negative controls we don't always have. We only have those when we know definitely what the outcome is going to be, like when we're testing um, for the presence or absence of a specific molecule. So with our biomolecules, we had a positive control because we could go in and we could test a known protein or a known sugar, or a known starch, and that just validates our reagents are working, our test results, here's what positive looks like. So anytime my unknown results look like this, that can help me interpret them. I compare my unknown results to the positive control, and if they look the same, it's positive. I choose my negative control to be a substance I'm going to test that I know doesn't have what I'm testing for. So we used water because we know it doesn't have any organic molecules in it. It's just H2O. So when I compare my unknown results with the negative control, if it looks the same as my negative control, then I know my result is a negative. Uh, and then that last one, analyze and interpret data in the forms of tables and graphs. Uh, when we look at graphs, we want to look, uh, we can tell a lot about the experiment and the experimental variables. What's on the x-axis is typically my independent variable, and what's on my y-axis is my dependent variable. If my independent variable is something that falls along a continuum, like pH goes from 0 to 14, so I could graph it left to right, increasing pH, um, then I'm probably going to use a line graph. If I'm uh, looking at specific, not continuous data, like uh, instead of a range of pHs, just simply acids, bases, neutral, then I'd use a bar graph because I don't know where on the acidity table I am. I only know my acid is below 7, my neutral is 7, and my base is um, higher than 7. So if I don't have a specific number, if I'm comparing distinct uh, separate entities that aren't on a continuum, um, like light and dark. I want to see what happens to a plant grown in light versus dark. I don't have a continuum, I just have these two items, so a bar graph would be what I'd use. But still with the independent variable um, on the x-axis. Questions on scientific method? No. All right. Uh, lab 2 was measurement. Um, and I think, I think everybody did pretty well on this. The most important thing to remember for the practical, uh, our objectives define what you should know. And so the words that, we are, that are presented on the objectives are the words that are the correct answer. Uh, so you will either get partial credit or no credit uh, if you go to Google and find something different. So, <laughs> for example, um, well, our objectives list the basic metric units to measure length, mass, volume, temperature, convert one metric unit to another, going kilo, hecta, deca. Those are my greater than one, and then my base unit. Deci is one tenth of one, centi is one hundredth, one one hundredth, and milli is one one thousandth. Um, demonstrate proficiency. That's what you did in the lab. Make sure you read the meniscus, know what the mis meniscus is. And our measurements are always in metric units. So if you Google how do I measure length and it tells you with a ruler in inches, you're going to get it wrong because this is a science class. We use metric. Uh, and so it will tell you in number four, 
where it talks about labware, we don't use just a ruler. It's a metric ruler. So we use a metric ruler. Our uh, unit for measuring mass is the triple beam balance. So you did use an electronic scale in lab, but our objectives specifically state triple beam balance. So we also have beakers, dropper pipettes, the volumetric pipette, which is more precise because we have those uh, gradations marked along the pipette. The pipette pump is what draws the liquid into the pipette. Our micro pipette are um, the small less than one mil broken down into tenth of mils or hundredth of mils or hundredth of, yeah, of mils, so small. Our Erlenmeyer flask is the one that um, that's our container where the neck narrows in. And then safety goggles, graduated cylinder. If we're measuring volumes, we can use a beaker, but the narrower our instrument is, the more precise our measurement. So graduated cylinder would be the preferred method. Um, test tubes, test tube rack, test tube holders, forceps, triple beam balance thermometer, uh, and metric ruler are all the items you should be able to identify if you see a picture of those or are asked how you would measure length, volume, mass, um, or temperature. Questions on metric measurement? No. All right. Uh, lab three for was ecology. And I think everyone's doing really well on, um, on the ecology, you know, autotrophs versus heterotrophs. A community is all of the different living organisms versus a population, which is organisms of all the same species. And when we expand to ecosystem, we consider the abiotic factors. So the non-living parts, the soil, the air, the water. Um, then knowing the trophic level levels, knowing herbivores, carnivores, omnivores, parasites, decomposers, and detritivores, what they eat. Uh, looking at the food chain, the symbiotic relationships, parasitism, one organism, the host is harmed while the parasite benefits, mutualism, both organisms benefit, and commensalism, one benefits and the other is neither harmed nor helped. The important thing to remember when you're analyzing these relationships, it's how these two organisms impact each other from the relationship. So one of the things in the lab that a lot of people got wrong was the sawbill bird. So the sawbill breaks down um, a dead organism to food it, feed it, breaks it apart, uses that sawbill, gets at it, um, and then leaves. And then, what was it, the bee comes in and uses the dead organism um, for nutrients and to lay eggs. So that would be commensalism because the bee benefits from what that uh, the bird did but the bird has no interaction with the bee specifically its activities impact the bee uh, but the bee's activities have no effect on it that common denominator of the dead animal has nothing to do with the relationship between those two specifically how they interact. So when you look at that and analyze what type of relationship it is, where it's the two organisms involved in the symbiosis, if there's a third that's external to that relationship, um, that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at how they, how this one affects this one and how the other one affects the first one. So their specific relationship to each other. Um, Survivorship curves, remember type one is humans. They have a um, low mortality rate early in life. Most organisms die toward the end of their lifespan. Type three is just the opposite. Most organisms die early. Uh, mortality comes at a very young age, early. Very few actually live through the entirety of the lifespan. Uh, and then type two is sort of that split the middle where you're equally likely mortality is about the same rate throughout the lifespan. Um, and then comparing that exponential J growth curve, which is uh, organisms reproducing at their biotic potential, their highest rate of reproduction. 
um, with no limits. And then the logistic growth curve, that's our S shape, where it, it levels off as we approach carrying capacity. So knowing the difference in those two graphs. Um, and I think everyone did, did really well on that lab, so, and on that quiz. Any questions on those? Um, no. Okay, and if you think of questions later, you can post those. Oh, go ahead. What, what, what was the main difference between um, commensalism and mutualism? So with mutualism, I think it's mutually beneficial. Both organisms have a positive impact on the other. So that when everybody thinks of finding Nemo, um, the clownfish and the anemone, the clownfish mm -hmm. benefits because it's protected from predators. Okay. And the anemone benefits because when the clownfish eats, it drops some stuff on it, you know, and so it gets some food and it gets some nutrients from the um from the clownfish. So they both benefit directly from their interactions with each other. Commensalism, one organism benefits from the actions of the other or from the presence of the other, uh, while the other one doesn't care, right? It has no, no benefit. It's not harmed, so it's not parasitized. It really just kind of ignores it like an owl in a tree. Does the tree really care? Yeah, probably not, but the owl gets protection. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, lab four was pH. And so the big one here is remembering which order. High acidity is low pH numbers. So that's reversed because the hydrogen, the proportion of hydrogen atoms in the solution is a fraction of the total solution. So we're looking at a denominator, and if we get bigger numbers of hydrogen in the denominator, it makes the pH number, the total number, smaller. So low numbers are acidic, high numbers are basic, um, and then neutral is seven. Uh, the solution, remember the, the words aren't interchangeable, and so even if I can tell from your answer that you meant the right thing, a solution has two parts, a solute and a solvent. In biology, that solvent is water. It's the universal solvent. So the solute's what's dissolved in there. So make sure you think about those words when you write that. Solution would be my pitcher of Kool-Aid. The solute would be the colored sugar dissolved in the solvent of water. Um, let's see, so identifying acid base. And then buffers. We're going to remember the important thing. Um, buffers aren't trying to get a solution to a neutral pH. A buffer prevents the solution from changing its pH. So if I put a buffer in a solution that's pH is two, I can add acid to it. It's not gonna get more acidic. The pH isn't gonna go down. And I can add a base to it and it's not gonna get more basic. The pH isn't gonna go up. That buffer is going to prevent a pH change. A buffer has a limited capacity. I can overwhelm it and change the pH, but buffered solutions will have a much smaller change in pH than an unbuffered solution. So buffers prevent or minimize any change in pH. They're not trying to get the pH to any specific um, position. So that's what buffering capacity is. How effective is that buffer at preventing a pH change? Questions about pH? Um, no, I don't think so. All right. Uh, basic chemistry. Um, I think again, this the I think everybody did did well on this. Kind of helped you work through this. We're figuring it out. We keep coming back to these um, these molecules. So knowing our four categories, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. And know those terms monomer and polymer um, are generic. They can apply to any of those. So if the question is what, uh, what are the building blocks of proteins, you can't say monomers because monomers are the building blocks of proteins, carbs, lipids, and nucleic acids. I need the specific 
building block of proteins, which would be an amino acid is the monomer and a polypeptide or a protein is the polymer. Um, for carbohydrates, it's a monosaccharide or a disaccharide. Those simple sugars are my building blocks. And the polysaccharide, so poly is many, that's my big molecule. Um, it's at amino acids and proteins. And then for uh, lipids, if, it's, if we're talking about oils and fats, we're looking at triglycerides. And the other one we talk about a lot in biology, but we didn't test for, were phospholipids, which are the main building block of plasma membranes. Um, but in the lab, we tested for triglycerides, oils or fats. Uh, and we want to know we build those. It kind of sounds counterintuitive. We build bigger molecules by removing a block, uh, by removing a water molecule. So dehydration synthesis or a dehydration reaction, we take away an H from one monomer, an OH from the other, and those two will join and become a dimer. And then we keep doing that to get polymers. So dehydration, by taking away a water, we get bigger and bigger molecules. By adding a water, we break them. So hydrolysis, if you look at that word, you see hydro is water, lysis is to break or burst. If we uh, use hydrolysis, we break apart a polymer using water. Uh, we looked at positive and negative controls already. A positive control, I can select, so I can only use positive and negative controls if I know um, what the outcome is going to be and how to get that outcome. So in this case, I knew that if I added my Biorets reagent to a protein, I should get a purple color. So I can select a protein, add the Biorets reagent, say, hey, look at that, it's a purple color. Um, I know it was a positive because I know that it was a protein that I added it to. I chose, let's say, albumin because I know that's egg white protein. So I knew I should get a positive result. Um, that lets me compare my unknown results. And if they look the same, then it's positive. If they don't, it's a negative. Um, that also validates my experiment. It shows me, yes, my reagents are working and I'm getting the results that I expect to get. So now when I add that same reagent to an unknown, I expect it's going to work properly. Same thing with a negative control. I'm gonna select something I know does not have uh, the molecule I'm testing for. So I know it should give me a negative result. And if I add my Biorets reagent to it, I shouldn't have a color change should still have that same pale blue that the Biorets was to begin with. Um, so I know my reagent is good and it's doing what it should be doing. And if my experimental results look like that sample, then it tells me this is a negative result. So these I can have when I know what the outcome is going to be and I can set up a control that will give me those outcomes. So I can't always have those. I don't know, for example, in the plants with fertilizer, that I mentioned earlier. I don't know how tall the plant is gonna grow anyway. I just know it's gonna grow. Um, so I don't have a positive or a negative. There's not a definitive result. If there is a definitive result that I know I can get um, with a designed experiment, then I can have a positive or a negative control. And then you should remember which reagent you used for what test. Benedict's reagent can only test simple sugars. So even though polysaccharides are built of simple sugars, their chemical properties are different once I have all those big long chains um, that are linked together in my polymer. So in my starch or my cellulose, it no longer has the same chemical properties. And so Benedict's reagent does not react with, that with those um, polysaccharides. So Benedict's is only for simple sugars, monosaccharides or disaccharides. Iodine is only for one specific polysaccharide. So all polysaccharides don't have the same test. Benedict's can test um, all my reducing or my simple sugars. Iodine is my test for starch and only starch. So if it asks, uh, if there's a question saying, um, what does iodine test for? If you write polysaccharides, that's wrong because it's only one polysaccharide.
starch. If I wanted to test for the presence of cellulose, I'd have to use a different reagent or chitin. I'd have to use a different reagent or um, glycerol. I'd have to use or glycogen. I'd have to use a different reagent. So this is only for starch. Um, Biuret's reagent tests for proteins. Proteins are made of amino acids linked together with peptide bonds. So what causes that color change are those peptide bonds. So if I have lots and lots and lots of peptide bonds, like I would with a big protein molecule, I'm going to get a purple color. Whereas if I have some smaller peptide chains of peptides, it's going to be a little paler, maybe pinkish. Um, but either one of those indicate peptide bonds. But if I have no peptide bonds, it will remain blue. Even though this is turning purple, it's sort of a transparent light purple. Iodine is a dark purple, black, blue, black. It's very, very dark. That's going to be the distinction. This is going to be translucent. Light can shine through it. Uh, with my iodine, it's going to be very dark, almost black. Um, so if you see a picture, those should be very distinct and different. The emulsification test was when I added, if I put um, oil and water, they separate. And in that test tube, I have the oil floating on top of the water. My emulsifier breaks that oil down into tiny bubbles that I can then shake up and they will distribute through the test tube. Um, and that will let me know that, oh, huh, that broke that down. That's lipid. Or I can use that brown paper, my paper test for lipids where it doesn't uh, evaporate that oil will stay on the paper and leave a grease smear. Uh, and I just described the appearance of emulsified lipids, emulsified their little tiny broken down dots like in the Dawn dish soap commercial. Uh, Dawn dish soap is an emulsifier. All right, questions on the chemical composition of cells, the bio, uh, the macromolecules? No. All right. Uh, the microscope, parts of the microscope. I think everybody was good on the parts of the microscope on the quizzes in the lab. Um, the, the one thing to be, um, be sure of is the mechanical stage is the part of the microscope that holds the slide and moves the slide. That's the moving part, it's mechanical. Um, the stage itself is just the platform that I lay the slide on. And then the mechanical stage is in the back and moves it. So the platform itself is the stage that has the little hole where the light shines through. The mechanical stage holds and moves the slide. It's that whole mechanism. Um, let's see. So ocular lenses, we look through those. The base or the foot is the base, the bottom, what it rests on when it's sitting down. The condenser and the iris diaphragm. So the condenser is underneath the stage and what it does is it focuses the light. So I can either condense the light to focus it through that hole or I can open that up and make the light more diffuse. And that just gives me more or less contract. Contrast, sorry. And the iris diaphragm is actually located inside the condenser and it does just what your iris does. It opens and closes to allow more or less light in. And then the nose piece is how I move between my objective lenses. The light source or sub substage light, that's my light bulb underneath that I turn on and light comes up through because these are light microscopes, meaning I have to have light shining through a very thin sample in order to see it. The objective lenses, I have Four objective lenses, the one with the red ring, that's four times magnification, is my scanning uh, lens. And that gives me the biggest field of view and the least magnification. That lets me locate my object on the slide, bring it into focus using the course adjustment. And after that, uh, to get to higher magnification, I'll use my rotating nose piece to go to the next highest, le highest lens, which is my 10 times magnification, the yellow ring around it. When I do that, I never, never, never have to use that coarse adjustment knob ever again. Our microscopes are parfocal, meaning if I'm in, uh, in focus, 
with my scanning lens, um, then I should be in focus as I move through all the other lens lenses. There's a little drift, so it might not be in perfect focus, but I just need my fine adjustment knob to bring it into sharp focus. So I never use my course adjustment knob except with the 4X, the scanning objective lens. That's because that's going to move my stage in big movements. So any movement of that is going to take me out of focus faster than into focus. And there's a chance I can hit that um, stage, hit my slide right up against that lens and crack the, le crack the lens or crack the slide. Uh, so I only use fine adjustment at these higher magnifications. After my 10X, uh, I have my blue ring, which is 40 times magnification. And then the highest magnification is the oil immersion lens, which we, that's my uh, 100 times magnification. I need oil because uh, diffraction as the light passes through the slide. When it hits the glass, it slows down and that light bends or diffracts. So it's not actually shining up into um, into the where I'm going to see it in the objective lenses. So it kind of shifts that out of out of whack. So I have to put oil on there because it has the same refractive index, and then that lets the light shine straight through. Um, so that's my highest magnification. And to figure total magnification, I would take uh, my objective lens and multiply it by my ocular lens. Not all microscopes have the same magnification on their ocular lenses, so you always have to look and see. Uh, I think usually we have 10x, but we do have a few microscopes in the labs that are 5x for the ocular lens or 15x. So that would give you, even though they all have the same objective lenses, it would change your total. But you multiply the ocular lens magnification times the objective lens magnification. That gives me my total. Uh, let's see. Proficiency in using field view. I think everybody did those in the lab. Um, and then you saw some examples in your virtual lab on the microscope. Any questions on the microscope? No. All right. Our prokaryo uh, prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell structures uh, are prokaryotes. Um, one of the things, the pictures, the images in the lab and the pictures that we look at uh, and the models of our bacterial cells, the prokaryotes, show all the possible structures that bacteria could have. So all cells have cytoplasm, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. All cells have a plasma membrane. All cells have ribosomes. Um, and all cells have uh, nucleic acid, DNA. So we have DNA in all cells. Bacteria, the distinctive feature is that they have cell walls. So all bacteria have cell walls. Um, so that's a distinct feature that lets them have specific shapes. All of these other structures, some bacteria have them, but not all bacteria have them. So that's not really something we could look at to differentiate bacteria, uh, prokaryotes from eukaryotes. Um, the big things that we could look at under the microscope are that our bacteria are going to be very much smaller. They are going to have distinct shapes because of that cell wall. Um, other than they are not going to have, so it's what they lack that really lets us dis distinguish prokaryotes from eukaryotes. They lack a nucleus and they lack a membrane bound, um, any other membrane bound organelles. And our eukaryotes are much larger. So it's what the bacteria lack that really lets us identify and differentiate them from our eukaryotes. Um, you should know that the glycocalyx, this is sort of an outer jelly-like coating that protects the bacteria and lets them stick together. A capsule is one example or one type of a glycocalyx. That's when it's very firm and well organized. Um, so the, the glycocalyx is this jelly-like coating. Um, and there are two types, a capsule or a slime layer. And so it's jelly-like, so the difference would be a capsule would be like jello surrounding it, very firm, holds its shape, um, whereas the slime layer would be more like syrup surrounding it. 
It's sticky, but not necessarily very firm or well organized. Flagella, uh, you can't really use this to differentiate prokaryotes and eukaryotes because some eukaryotes have flagella. Not all bacteria have flagella. Not all eukaryotes have flagella. So they may have this, but they don't always. It's used for motion and they're different structures. Hang on one second. Hey, honey, can you let the dog out, please? Okay, sorry. Dog's in a hurry to go out. It's barking at me. All right, um, so flagella, the pili is a specialized structure that's used for bacteria to uh, exchange bits of DNA. So it's not for sexual reproduction. We don't have male and female bacteria. Uh, they don't ever use like one half of this organism's DNA and one half of that's come together to make a new organism. They just say, hey, look, I have this cool gene. You want it? Let me make a copy of this gene right here and send it over to you. Um, so they have the pili for that. The nucleoid is just the region where the DNA is floating around. Plasmids are little extra chromosomal bits of DNA. So a lot of times they'll make a copy of just this little extra chromosomal bit of DNA and share that through the pili. Um, the fimbriae are little thread-like structures that bacteria have that eukaryotes don't. These are not the same as cilia. These are just little threads around the outside and it lets them attach to things by getting those threads tangled. Um, but they are, um, they're not like cilia, the little short beading structures that are used for motility in eukaryotes. No prokaryotes have cilia. Uh, conjugation pili, that's just a different term that you'll see used with pili. Because uh, conjugation is that process in bacteria that is not conjugation like sex, it's conjugation like here, let me give you this piece of DNA. Uh, you looked at the cyanobacteria, you looked at the, the blue-green algae. They do have uh, pigment, chlorophyll A, that gives them the color, but they don't have chloroplasts like plants do. So they did have color, but they didn't have chloroplasts. Uh, and then the parts of the eukaryote. So you should know all those membrane-bound organelles. Again, plasma membrane, all cells have that. Um, all cells have cytoplasm, all cells have DNA. But in eukaryotes, that's housed in the nucleus. The nucleolus is some is a region within the nucleus that's really dense. So if we just look at a stained cell, there's going to be the dark nucleus, and in there, there's going to be a little darker portion. And that's dark because it's really densely packed um, with RR and with ribosomal RNA and polypeptides that are going to leave the nucleus and go form ribosomes. So the nucleolus is the place in the nucleus where the ribosomal subunits are formed. So the building blocks of ribosomes are made in the nucleolus. A nuclear envelope uh, is the membrane surrounding the nucleus. Only plants have a central vacuole. So eukaryote animals can have vacuoles, just membrane bound little carrying um, carrying vesicles, but that big main vesicle, that big vacuole that takes up, um, that is very dominant or dominates a plant cell is the central vacuole. And then our ribosomes, cytoprotein synthesis, synthesis our endoplasmic reticulum, uh, we build molecules, either proteins in the rough ER or lipids and carbs in the smooth ER. Uh, we build those and then we break off little transport vesicles to move those um, to the Golgi apparatus where they'll be processed into their final molecule that's going to be exported to the plasma membrane uh, and then out of the cell. Our vesicles are formed just through little plasma membrane sacs by breaking those off from either the endoplasmic reticulum or the Golgi apparatus. If that membrane is sort of the same consistency as olive oil. So just like oil can break into smaller bubbles, that's uh, how we get these vesicles. Lysosomes are a specific vesicle that's broken off that contains digestive enzymes. Uh, and that is used to get rid of cellular garbage. 
peroxisomes are a type of lysosome that specifically gets rid of uh, toxic waste products from cellular respiration. The mitochondria are the site of ATP or energy production. Plants and animals both have mitochondria because both cells need to get ATP in order to do work. Chloroplasts are cell specific structure found only in plants because they're the site of photosynthesis. So plants make their food, they make their glucose through photosynthesis, and then that glucose goes to the mitochondria to be broken down to get ATP for energy. And the cytoskeleton are the protein filaments that are used to move things around the cell. Cilia and flagella, some but not all eukaryotes have these and use them for motility. Flagella is a single long whip-like structure. And then the cilia are little short beating hairs that work like a oars on a Viking ship is what I think of them as. And then the centriole, this is only found in animal cells, not plants. So it's those two barrel-like structures that sit perpendicular to each other. Uh, and we'll look more closely at those when we look at cell division and mitosis, but they organize the cytoskeleton components uh, that are involved in, um, in mitosis and cellular division. And then looking at those parts, identifying those either on the, on the models, on pictures, be able to identify all those. Um, and identify protozoans, right? Our, our amoeba and our paramecium. You should see the nucleus. That's how you're gonna be able to tell. Our amoeba move through pseudopods. So they have this kind of wavy um, exterior as they move use that cytoplasm to push their plasma membrane out and then stream that cytoplasm in. Uh, paramecium have cilia. So you should be able to identify those structures on prokaryotes, eukaryotes, and differentiate between plants and animals. Questions on our cells? No questions. All right. Diffusion and osmosis, here we are. All right, so um, diffusion, movement of molecules from high concentration to low concentration. This requires no energy. This can refer to any molecule at all moving down its concentration gradient. And it can pertain to any medium. So uh, somebody gave the example of uh, a tea bag, putting the tea bag into hot water. You see the tea diffuse through the liquid. That's diffusion through liquid. If I spray perfume in the air, I think you gave this example. Spray perfume in the air, it's going to be really, really concentrated right where I spray it, if I spray it right here. But give it time, and it's going to spread throughout the room until the molecules are evenly distributed everywhere. Um, so that's diffusion, and molecules will move until equilibrium, until they're equally distributed everywhere. Diffusion doesn't have to have a membrane. We're not necessarily talking about a membrane, but when we're talking about biology, we're looking at movement across a membrane. So examples of diffusion are when we inhale, breathe in oxygen, we get a high concentration of oxygen in our lungs that diffuses uh, across the membranes into our bloodstream and is carried to our cells, where that high concentration of oxygen diffuses into our cells which have been using oxygen for metabolism, so they have a low concentration. So oxygen diffuses in. As we use up that oxygen in metabolism, we produce carbon dioxide. So inside our cells, we have a high concentration of carbon dioxide. That diffuses from high concentration inside the cell to low concentration in my blood vessels, where that carbon dioxide is carried back to the lungs and exhaled. Uh, in our lab experiment, Dialysis tubing uh, is our surrogate for a membrane. It is semi-permeable. So dialysis tubing is basically like a big piece of cellophane with tiny holes in it. Any molecule small enough to move through the hole can pass through and the direction it's gonna pass is from a high concentration to low. So it's gonna go down the concentration gradient. Um, so can you see my screen? I see you've got, you're here in person. 
Oh, yeah. Steal Thank your phone. You. Okay. So I put this um, this image to show difference between active and passive transport. If you think of a concentration gradient, gradient just means slope. So if I'm on my bicycle at the top of the hill and I put myself down, I'm going to go down. I don't have to pedal. I don't need to put energy in. So passive transport. I go from high concentration to low. The steeper the slope is, the faster this is going to happen. And this is going to keep going until I reach level ground equilibrium. Active transport requires energy because I'm going to go from low concentration to high. If I go uphill, I'm going to have to pedal. So I'm going to have to do some work. I'm going to have to put energy in. Uh, so anytime we're moving from low concentration to high, it's active transport and we need ATP. Um, so osmosis, diffusion is the movement of molecules from high concentration to low. Right? And that's anywhere, any molecule. Osmosis is a very specific case of diffusion. It's the diffusion of water from high water concentration to low water concentration. Because I'm looking at solutions, it means it's something dissolved in water. And when I give the concentration of a solution, I'm giving the concentration of the solute, the thing that's dissolved in the water, not the water's concentration. So that's why it's easy to flip this upside down and get these wrong. Um, Cause I can also say osmosis is the movement of water from an area of low solute concentration to high solute concentration. Well, that's going low to high. Doesn't that sound like active transport? It's not because if my solute concentration is lower, in one solution compared to the other, then my water concentration must be higher in this one than in the other. So the water is going down its concentration gradient toward the higher solute, the hypertonic solution. Uh, so let's see, we talked about solute, solvent, solution, and then, so those terms, the, the big thing to remember is, I'm not talking about one solution when I use these terms. These are terms that I always have to have a more than, less than. So I'm comparing two things. They're relative. It's comparing one solution to another and specifically one solution on one side of the membrane to the solution on the other side. So um, if here's my Here's my glass. This is the solution outside. The glass is the membrane. There's my solution inside. If this side has a higher solute concentration, I can't have higher without having a higher than what? If this has higher solute concentration, that must have lower solute concentration because I'm comparing these two solutions inside and outside the cup. Higher solute concentration, hypertonic. Lower solute concentration, hypotonic. So water is always going to move toward the hypertonic solution because if I have a higher solute, if I have more salt here, hypertonic, more salt than what? Than this, lower salt. Well, if that's lower salt, that means it must have more water because out here I have more salt, so I must have less water because my solution is made of water plus solute. Um, so that's why it sounds like wait, it's going to the higher solute. Isn't that up the concentration gradient? No, because it's the water to water concentration gradient. I'm comparing water to water and I'm comparing solute to solute, the same solute. So salt to salt um, or sugar to sugar, whatever the solute I'm talking about is. Um, and then so does that make does that make sense, Jakaya? Is that yeah, that made more sense than anything that I've heard yet, so. Okay, good, good. Yeah, that's a, it's easy to confuse that because you're talking about going up, down, but you have to know like which, which molecule am I talking about? Um, and yeah. then putting these terms together for the different, um, for what happens to the plasma membrane. So turgor pressure is when that central vacuole fills up with water and it pushes against the plasma membrane and it pushes the plasma membrane against the cell wall. Now my plants are all firm and perky. Um, plasmolysis is when the water in that 
central vacuole starts to get used because I haven't watered my plant in a while. So it starts to leave the cell. If my cell is in hypertonic solution, the water is going to move out and the central vacuole is going to shrivel. Its membrane is going to pull away. Then the plasma membrane is going to pull away from the cell wall. So that plasma membrane is going to shiv shrivel. My cell is still going to have the same shape because of the cell wall because a plant cell wall is going to stay same shape. It's just going to lose water. So inside it's going to shrivel and then my plants are going to wilt. Um, so that's plasmolysis. And then cytolysis, lysis. So, so plasmolysis, this is the time we use lysis incorrectly. My plasma membrane doesn't actually lyse, it just shrivels. When I'm looking at animal cells, I can look at cytolysis is um, Water is going to enter the cell till it bursts. All right, so cyto is cell, lysis is burst. So if I put my cell into a hypotonic solution, water is going to enter the cell. And because animals don't have that cell wall, it can keep entering until equilibrium, till I reach equilibrium. Well, if I reach equilibrium, those, those phospholipids, you know, they've got some room to expand. So if I reach equilibrium, when I've expanded a certain amount, I'm okay. But if I keep expanding, I'm going to pull those uh, phospholipids in my membrane apart and my cell's going to burst. And hemolysis is specifically referring to red blood cells with hemoglobin. Um, and then crenation is if I put my cell, my animal cell, into hypertonic solution, the water is going to leave the cell and it's going to shrivel. So crenation happens to animal cells in hypertonic solution. Good on those terms? Yes. All right. And then our last lab that's covered on the practical um, is enzyme function. Everybody should be finishing those now. I will have the um, the video that goes along with the PowerPoint posted um, for these two labs this afternoon. But this is pretty, this is, this is kind of key to all biology. We talk about homeostasis and we keep homeostasis with regard to temperature, pH, oxygen levels, water levels, everything. And really it's to keep our enzymes happy um, because our enzymes are proteins that are used in metabolism. So metabolism, the sum total of all the chemical reactions in a cell. Well, all those chemical reactions would take place anyway, but they would take place just kind of at their own sweet time because chemical reactions rely on the elements or the uh, molecules coming into close enough contact for those electrons to interact with each other. So enzymes speed that up. And they speed it up to a rate that we need to maintain life, right? to maintain all our functions. So for me to metabolism to happen at the rate that we need it to get what we need when we need it, those chemical reactions have to take place at a faster rate. Enzymes can speed up the rate of reaction up to a million times faster than they would occur in their own sweet time. Enzymes can't make a reaction happen that wouldn't happen anyway. So they're going to make that happen by lowering the activation energy. How much energy do I have to put in for this reaction to occur? Um, so that's technically how I'm going to make that happen. My enzymes are proteins. And so we learned, when we learned about proteins, we have to have the right order of amino acids so that they fold or pleat or curl the right way so that they fold back into their three-dimensional shape the right way so that they get their final structure is the exact shape for what they do. So if this is my molecule that my enzyme acts on, the enzyme is the exact shape to make that happen. So if this is my enzyme, this is my substrate. If I wrote it as a chemical reaction, my substrate would be my reactant. Those are synonyms, but I only use substrate if I'm talking about uh, reaction that uses an enzyme. So substrate, the thing that 
the enzyme is specific to act on. My enzyme is the exact correct shape. The spot that's the right shape for the substrate is called the active site. When my enzyme meets my substrate and they connect, this is called the enzyme substrate complex. And when that happens, my enzyme, once it connects to its substrate, is going to do a slight conformational change that's going to make the reaction happen. Let's say here the reaction is to break this molecule apart. So it's going to change its shape. That's called the induced fit model. Right? Once my substrate fits into the enzyme, it induces a change, and that results in the products. Then my enzyme releases the products, off they go, um, and my enzyme returns to its shape and is ready to do that again. So my enzyme can just keep doing that same reaction over and over again, latching onto the substrate, forming the enzyme substrate complex, making the reaction happen, reducing, releasing the products, goes back, starts all over again. Um, be very careful when you look at the image in the lab manual and in the textbook to follow the arrows. So there's some images. I have one enzyme for one reaction. Every enzyme is the exact right shape for its substrate. And I can have enzymes that break down big molecules into smaller ones, so degradative. Or I can have molecules that take, uh, enzymes that take smaller molecules and combine them to make bigger ones, so synthesis reactions. Um, to know which one it is, follow the arrows, right? So follow the arrows. The arrows follow the direction of the reaction, just like in a chemical reaction. I start with this, I move to that. Um, people tend to trip up on that by reading the images in the book top to bottom, but it's follow the arrows. That's the direction that the uh, reaction is occurring in. So substrate, that's a synonym for reactants, for what binds with the enzyme. And then in lab, you did some experiments looking at the effect of temperature, pH. Oop, that's upside down. <laughs> oh, now it's reversed. <laughs> um, and enzyme concentration on the rate of reaction. Let's see if I can. Flip my picture. Oh, well, you'll get it. Um, so this is important when we talk about homeostasis. It's important we maintain the right temperature because um, enzymes have an optimum temperature where they function best. At colder temperatures, the rate of reaction decreases. Nothing, the, the enzyme's shape isn't impacted by cold but just the molecular energy, it can't move as fast, so it can't work as fast. So colder temperatures, slower reaction. Most enzymes in our body have this optimal point right around 37 degrees Celsius, our body temperature. If we increase the temperature, we increase the kinetic energy, the rate the molecules move at, so we can increase the rate of reaction a little bit, but we have a limit because at about 105 degrees Fahrenheit, it's about 42, 41 degrees Celsius, the hydrogen bonds that are holding my protein in its specific shape will start to break. And we call that denaturing. My enzyme loses its shape. So proteins denature when the hydrogen bonds that hold them in their specific shape start to break. Uh, there's a little bit of flexibility if I start to get a little too high and those bonds just loosen. If I reduce the temperature, those enzymes can go back to their shape. But if I keep adding heat, it's not reversible. Once the enzyme's denatured, it's gone and we see no more enzyme activity because I no longer have my enzymes. So the relationship between temperature and enzyme activity is as I increase temperature, I increase the rate of enzyme, uh, of enzyme activity until I get so hot that I start to denature my enzyme. And then once I've denatured my enzymes, the reaction stops. Then we looked at pH. Again, 
pH is my measure of hydrogen ions, the hydrogen potential. Those hydrogens can interfere with those hydrogen bonds um, that hold the, uh, the molecule, the enzymes 3D shape specifically. So if I change the pH, I start to alter the shape of my enzyme. Enzymes have a specific pH and it's not always seven. So depending on where this enzyme is formed, where it functions, it will have an optimal pH that can differ. So P, uh, enzymes that work in my bloodstream or in my small intestine have a slightly basic pH as their optimum. This peak of activity would be between 7.4 and 8, depending on where I am. And if I got higher or lower than that, like if I got toward a pH of 7, I would start to denature. My reaction would start to slow. If I'm an enzyme that works in the stomach, I work best at a pH of 2. So my fastest rate, this peak, would be at pH 2. And if I got to pH 7, chances are it would be completely denatured. There would be no chemical reaction. Or if I got lower. So the relationship between pH and enzyme activity is enzymes work at their optimal rate, at their fastest rate, at their optimal pH, what they're designed to work at. And that differs from enzyme to enzyme. If the pH gets higher or lower than the optimal pH for that enzyme, the rate of reaction declines. And as, the, as we get further and further away from the optimal pH, I'm going to denature my protein and the reaction will stop. Uh, and then we also looked at enzyme concentration. And because the rate of reaction is related to how often the enzyme comes into contact with its substrate, uh, the more of that enzyme I have in a solution, the more often it's going to come into contact with its substrate. So as I increase the enzyme concentration, and it increase the rate of reaction until I reach saturation. At saturation, that means every single one, I've got so many enzymes in there, every single one of those enzyme molecules uh, is busy right now. It's converting a substrate to a product. Uh, and so now my rate of reaction can't get any faster until I've read do still with those enzymes are going to work at that rate until I've completely converted all of my substrate um, to product and then the reaction will stop. But that's the maximum rate. But the relationship there is as I increase concentration, I increase rate of reaction. Right. I'd have a similar curve if I did substrate concentration. As I increase substrate concentration, I'm going to get more collisions with the enzyme until all the enzymes are busy and I don't have any more, um, any, any more increase. The reaction just goes at its fastest rate until completion. Uh, let's see. I think that covers all of our um, learning objectives for that lab. Any questions on enzymes? So for temperature and pH, there's always going to be an optimal, like, number that they reach before they get denatured? Yes. So, for temperature, I'm just going to have a slower reaction at colder temperatures. But I'm not going to denature. Colder temperatures don't denature them. It just slows down their movement. So, they'll just go slower. Um, but as I, because you, you see this never gets, uh, this graph never gets to zero on the coldest temperatures. It's not going to denature them, it's just going to slow them down. And as I increase temperature, the rate increases to the optimum. And if I get higher than that, then I start to denature my enzyme and then it crashes. But pH, either direction, higher or lower than the optimum. So this is where I work the best. And if I get either higher or lower, I'm going to denature my enzyme. Okay. Right, so they so they both do have an optimum. The difference is that uh, getting too much lower on temperature doesn't denature my enzyme. It just slows it down. Getting okay. higher temperature denatures. pH either too acidic or too basic. Either one of those denatures my enzyme. 
Okay. All right. But if you think of any other questions, um, just go ahead and put them in the discussion or email me. Let me know. Uh, anybody else who's watching this later before you take the lab practical, uh, post those questions that you have in the discussion or email, text. Let me know what questions you have. Um, and good luck on the practical. I think you're all going to do great. You've been doing well in the labs. Thank you. Thank you, Jakaya. See you later. Have a good day. You Bye. too. Bye-bye.